Thank you very much. Um, this is truly an amazing honor. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Pascal, the Guardian Group. Uh, the relationship that I've seen with the Guardian Group and UWE has been amazing from what I've seen. And I've seen many places around the world, and, and this is one of the best relationships I have seen. It's, it's truly amazing. And Dr. Anna Mae Edwards-Henry, um, she has been a gracious host, a fabulous person with whom to collaborate and talk about future projects, and her entire staff at the Center for um, Excellence in Teaching and Learning, and their new uh, office that they'll be moving into very shortly is truly going to be the envy of pretty much everyone in the world. It's an amazing space, and so I shouldn't overspeak that because they might take it away from her. It's adequate space. Um, <laughs> Thank you all the rest for coming here, um, guests and, and the press and everyone. Um, I, I'm going to give full credit to someone in Alaska I once met, an elder who, as she started to give her presentation, she said something that has stuck with me for my entire life. It's, it's been many years ago that she said this, and she was about three foot six and about 90 years old, and she stood up to the microphone and she said, thank you. Thank you all. You see, if you didn't leave your families today, if you didn't put aside all the things that you could have been doing this evening and come here, then we wouldn't have had a gathering. And if we didn't have a gathering, we wouldn't have an opportunity for me to participate in this gathering. And so as I've learned from her and I would like to express to you is I appreciate your willingness to come here this evening so that we could have a gathering together. So thank you all. Appreciate that. Now to get rolling on the topic. When you pick a topic title, I started doing, my children said that this is, looks evil, so I have to stop that. Um, <laughs> when you pick a topic, there's so many different possibilities. And so as we chatted back and forth about the possibilities, this, this came up. And almost immediately after, after we kind of settled on it, it was shortly after that, that Dr. Edwards Henry said the title really should be a little different. It should be in the world should be added to it. He thinks big. Education is something that's new to my family. I'm the first generation in my family to go to higher education. My parents were, in fact, my entire family were farmers. They worked in factories. And when I got old enough that I graduated from high school, I said, I think I'd like to go to college. And my mother said, I don't know if anybody in our family is smart enough to make it in college, but if anyone can make it, Todd can. So I left to school with that feeling of weight on my shoulders. And when I showed up at school, I had never really been on a college campus. I had actually been on college campuses three times in my entire life. And two of those were to visit the school I was going to. And once I started school, it was really interesting because shortly after I started, my first exam that I got back in a chemistry class was an F minus minus. I didn't know what an F minus minus was. So I went to the instructor and knocked on the door and said, Professor Jones, I do not understand this F minus minus. And he says, given that you received an F minus minus, it doesn't surprise me you fail to comprehend it. <laughs> so I thought at that moment I will never be a teacher like that. I'm never going to be the kind of individual that when a student works up his nerve or her nerve to come to the class or come to my office and talk to me, that I would actually say to them, if you're too stupid to understand what you have, then you should go away, which basically was his comment. I almost dropped out of school that day. When, schools, when students fail their first test at a college or university, psychologically that is an incredibly important point because we know from lots and lots of studies and looking at different human behavior characteristics that the, the thought that will come to mind is, I was high school smart, I was primary school smart, I'm not university smart. And at that point, we have to convince the student that they should be in school. So that's the concept of playing around today with this great profession where we change people's lives. And so I've used several quotes. We'll be bouncing around with some quotes and some of my own research that I've done and also some things that I've read. Whoops, past here. One of the first ones is Alvin Toffler wrote a book called Future Shock several years ago. But I love this quote. Illiteracy can no longer be defined in terms of reading. It's not simply reading. There are so many pieces of information out there and so many things going on. It's this new ability. As teachers, we have to teach our students. 
as parents, we have to teach our children. The most important thing that you can learn to do in this day is to learn how to learn, to unlearn, and relearn. Now, that becomes difficult. It's hard enough for me to convince my students to learn something, much less to tell them you're going to have to learn it and then unlearn it and learn something new. And how in the world do you tell your students that the things you're learning today probably will have absolutely no value in a few years, but you still need to learn them? And the students will look at you and say, if they're going to have no value, why should I learn it? And the answer, of course, is to be literate. You have to learn how to learn these things. You need that foundation to move forward. So that is a framework from which we are going to be playing around with. This one is from Lee Iacocca, who um, has done a lot of things. My home state is Michigan, and Lee Iacocca saved Chrysler Corporation and did some other things, like invented the Mustang. Give him credit for that. In a completely rational society, the best of us would be teachers, and the rest would have to settle for something else. That would be kind of nice to think. Compare that to this phrase. How many of you at some time of your life have you heard this phrase of he who can does and he who can't teach? Raise your hand if you've heard that at some point. Raise your hand if you would think that the person who said it should be slapped. <laughs> I like to think of it a different way, though. Um, George Bernard Shaw was not one of the most famous teachers in the world, so we're going to discount his phrase right away and go with something else. I've seen this several times, but I can't find a phrase for it. Those who know do and those who understand teach. And my favorite is from Todd Whitaker, who says, teaching is the profession that makes all professions possible. Is there a profession out there that didn't require a teacher? One day my sister had been in a terrible accident, and she's fine now. But she'd been in this awful accident. She was in intensive care, and we couldn't get the doctors. My family was there. They couldn't get the doctors to pay any attention to them at all. So we took turns sitting in her room with her while she was unconscious. Um, it was a couple days before she regained consciousness from this accident. Um, so sitting in the room one night at about midnight, I didn't have anything else to do, so I pulled out my grade book. Those of you who are old enough to remember... There used to be these old kind of green covered grade books that you would write all these notes in. They're different colors, but you'd write all your grades in. If, you had, if you're going to drop the lowest test, you had to go across and put an X through it, and then you'd total them up. I mean, we have spreadsheets that do all this. But in the day, there were these grade books. So I was sitting in her room. I pulled out the grade book, and I started to record some grades. A neurosurgeon comes in, stops. Hello. And he introduced himself to me. And I thought, well, that's interesting because my family had said that these individuals were pretty much ignoring, the surgeons were ignoring them. And so he introduced him. He asked me if I had any questions. I asked him what was going on and different questions. And then he left. And I talked to a friend of mine the next day at the university. I said, this is a puzzling thing. He says, oh, no, no, no. He says, every surgeon has feared the grade book. <laughs> as soon as he saw a grade book, the greatest surgeon in the world says, oh, I've got to get an A. <laughs> So the grade book has much power to it. So teaching. Teaching is that profession that really does push all professions. The other thing that I wanted to mention real quickly is that all masters, everyone who is good at their trade has had teachers, much, I mean, much like the professions. Sorry, I do have to be distracted for just a moment. I forgot to start a timer, and I have a terrible habit of going for three or four hours at a time. So excuse me for setting the timer so that we only do an hour or so. Anyway, uh, so here we go. Masters at trades are those skilled of any have had some teachers at some point. That, that concept of, of teaching is the profession that makes all professions possible. Now what's really interesting to me on this particular point is that not all masters are good teachers. An individual can actually start out, become, be taught, surpass the teacher in the skill set in which you were teaching that child or that individual and become better than you could ever be at that thing. And yet at that point, they couldn't teach the next generation because there's still a difference between a highly skilled individual doing his or her craft and the person who knows how to teach someone to do that craft. Tiger Woods is the best golfer in the world. You never hear about Tiger Woods' training camp where he's a teacher. 
Well, part of the reason is because he's making billions of dollars. But aside from that, he's not a teacher of golf. In fact, he still has a teacher. Uh, a, a, a teacher. He has a teacher. One of my favorite stories ever, I shared it with my students for weeks. Um, and you know, I have different things that come up and I use different things. But I shared it for several weeks before I moved to the next task. It was Tiger Woods when he was ranked as the number one golfer in the world. And it said in the article that he was working on his short game. And I love that. If you are the best person in the world and you're still working on some aspect of what you do, and by that he meant working with his teacher, then it means everybody, including us, everybody can be working to get better. And if we have the right teacher, we're all getting better. And that's a great concept. Because I've hear people at times say, oh, I've already got that down. Oh, I'm really good at that. Oh, I'm fabulous at that. And I don't need to get better. If the best people in the world are getting better, so should we. In fact, I'm a faculty developer as well. And so my big thing is I work with faculty all the time. And those of you who are faculty, raise your hand real quickly if you're a faculty member, please. Just jock your hand up in the air. Okay. Put your hand here if you're not a faculty member. See, I had to do both to find out whether or not you just didn't like putting your hands in the air. <laughs> so now we've got to try it one more time. Faculty members, hand up. All right, good chunk. Non-faculty members, hand up. All right, so it's about two-thirds, one-third. Very good. So I like to just test and see where we're at. So for teachers, when teachers say, oh, I'm already an expert teacher. I'm really good at this. I don't need to go to a workshop. I don't need to get better at this thing. Uh, that scares me because I don't consider myself a professional teacher. I consider myself a good teacher, and I'm continuing to work at it, but I'm not a professional teacher. Keep working at that. And people say, oh, but I've been teaching for 20 years. You know what? I have been driving for 20 years, and I'm not a professional driver. So we keep, I've been eating for 20 years. Actually, I'm kind of a professional eater. <laughs> I'm really, really good at that. So here's a quick task I would like to try real quickly. Think of, for everybody in the room, think for just a moment of the best teacher you have ever had in your life. Get that person in your head. Who is the best teacher you have ever had in your entire life? Now I'd like to do something that I often do in my classrooms, and I'm going to actually ask you, even though this is set up this, excuse me, this way, to share this with someone near you. Have one other person, it's called a pair share, so just one other person, chat with the person. If you have to, we could do threes, but twos are better. And just tell that person, what is it about the individual you just thought of, the best teacher, why was that your best teacher? Just something real quickly, so share back and forth. Why was that person your best teacher? Just do that. Okay, it was a quick little exercise. I'm going to stop right there. You'll notice that I'm not going to go down the road of who was the worst teacher. We don't need to do that tonight. That's not what it's about. But we all probably have a worst teacher. You didn't need to nod that much. <laughs> My worst teachers all kind of blend in together to pretty much one bad person, I suppose. But my good teachers, at first I can come up with one name every time. And it was an individual much like you were saying. An individual with a small statement one day. I was taking a class in about this size room, 400 students. My major was criminal justice. I was going to become a police officer. And this was in, I wasn't going to be a chemist. <laughs> we established that, the F minus minus, long way to come back from there. Um, but I was going to be a police officer, and I was taking a psychology class. And one day when I finished my exam, and I, you had to walk down to the front, you put your exam on the table. There were TAs in the room, teaching assistants. But the head professor was always in the front pacing. And as I laid my test down in a room that there was no way he could know who I was, he walked by and he said, what is your major? And I said, this was about halfway through the semester, I said, it is it's uh, criminal justice to be a police officer, but I'm thinking about changing it to psychology. He said, keep thinking. And he walked away. <laughs> and I just, at that moment, I thought, boy, I, I just, I loved the way he would, he would give me little phrases, and he would give the class little phrases that would send us thinking about different things and toy with a little bit, and then he would move on. 
So he never answered a question for me, but he always asked really good questions. And so having a conversation with some of my, my, my new friends here at UE, and we started talking about that concept of when you're the expert in the room and students expect you to have the answers, maybe the new type of teaching, the way to be a really good teacher is not to be the one with all the answers, but to be the one with the questions. And in particular, after I was chatting with a few other people about this concept, it really struck me, I'm going to go home and I have to really think this through a lot. Maybe a really, really good teacher is the one who knows the next perfect question. Wherever you are, someone who's a really good teacher knows the next thing that she or he should ask you. And then as soon as you start to answer that and think about it, the individual knows the next thing. That's very different from somebody who would stand here and say, let me tell you all the things that I know. And in fact, one of the things I know faculty are bad at is subtraction. They're very good at addition because they want to tell you everything they've ever learned and everything they think you need on top of that. But they're not good at subtracting the things out that you don't need. So we need to figure out how can we play around with that a little bit. We do have some big challenges. I just put down five here because we don't have a lot of time. But there are lots of challenges to being a good teacher. We have students these days who won't pay attention. Students who can't pay attention and certainly have a lot of distractions. I have students who claim and uh, complain about being bored at times. Oh, this is so boring what we're doing here. Students who won't prepare for class. Please read chapter four for class. Class comes and sure enough, they have not all read chapter four. By the way, and I don't want to offend anybody in here, but I used to do faculty development workshops where I would send readings ahead of time for the faculty to read. All right, you see what happens. <laughs> First of all, you're happy I didn't give you reading. <laughs> Had I done that, half of you would not have come because you think I didn't do the reading, I shouldn't go. The other half would say, well, I didn't do the reading, but I can preach and just go anyway. Some of you would have just highlighted the first sentence of every paragraph <laughs> and pretended to have read. And then a few of you would have read it very carefully. But the fact is, when I would show up at these workshops and say to the faculty, OK, let's have a little quiz and make sure you've all done the homework, they would get angry with me because they were busy. They had other things to do. And so the same type of thing I hear from my students a lot. Poor pay, I mention that because we did a television interview yesterday and it seemed to be the theme of the entire interview was how poorly <laughs> teachers were paid. In case it's a secret and you don't know, those of you who are teachers, you are paid poorly. Okay? I'm not paid well compared to my other people. I work in a school of medicine now and I'm a faculty educator. I'm the lowest paid person in the school, this is being taped, isn't it? <laughs> but I love being there. <laughs> and even if my boss offered me a raise, I would turn it down. <laughs> I would. But we are not paid well. And there are reasons that we're not paid well that we need to address at times. One of the reasons I am dead sure of, I know this is true, is that we, people discount our expertise because everybody can teach. If you teach a child to tie her shoes, if you teach a child how to get to the store, if you teach a child how to do anything, how to make a sandwich, whatever it is, then you're a teacher. And if you're a teacher, we're all teachers, it's not a special skill. Brain surgery, that's a special skill. Science, that's a special skill. Being an insurance adjuster, that's very special skill. All of these skill sets that we have that people have to learn very specific things for, they go to school, they study, and when they're done, we say things like, oh, I could never do that. And the statement, I could never do that, means you should be paid well, you should be well respected, because that's a really hard thing to do. Oh, teaching? Yeah, I could do that, if I had to. And they're wrong. Good teachers is not something you just up and do. Here's one quick statement I'll have for those of you who don't teach, and I'll tell you if you can thank a teacher well, at the reception today, it would be great. Not me. I'm talking to people in the room here. Here's why. What do we do as teachers? We walk a very fine line with every student in the room, and I'm going to put my hands like this to represent one student. If I present the material a little bit too slow below this point here, the person gets bored. 
If they get bored, they shut down. We all know that, right? If I go too fast above this line, they get frustrated. If I move too fast, if I'm too high of a complex, I can't break it down simple enough, you get frustrated, I lose you. Anything above here, you get frustrated, you don't pay attention. Anything below here, you get bored, you don't pay attention. Some students have zones like this. Some students are like this. They can go from bored to frustrated faster than we can blink. And we have to keep them in there. We have to teach them how to spread this zone out a little more. Now, that would be one student on a given day. Now the problem is, I'm going to change to this. There's one student, but then I got another student that's like this. And another student that's like this. And another student that's like this. And one like this. And they're all over the place. Now I have to think, how am I going to help each one of those students? They get bored, get frustrated. If I do this, you're bored, you're frustrated. And then the worst case is they change every day. Because as soon as you learn something new, you move from here up to here. Because now, if I teach you the same thing two days in a row, you're going to get bored. You already learned that, so you move up. If we get into really complex material, you might say, slow down. If we get into simpler material, you say, speed up. So you are moving all over the place all the time, while everybody else is moving all over the place. If you really think about it, teaching is nearly impossible. When you put 30 human beings in a room, and we're supposed to move them. And the cool thing is, we do. And you do. And when you move those people, you're doing something that is like rocket science, or brain surgery, or engineering, or anything else. And somehow, we have to get people to understand that's a skill set where I can change the world based on what I'm doing, but you need to give me credit for doing that. So there's something we have to work on, but I think number four is something we really have to work at. Number five kind of goes along with number six, or number four. We have poor working conditions at times. I'll tell you, I, buy, I bought a case of paper one time because my school, Central Michigan University, was so financially, you talk about coming from places of privilege and lots of money, I was given a ream of paper and told, that is your paper for the semester. If you use any more than that, you must buy it yourself. Anybody in here ever bought your own paper? I asked that because I knew you had. Why in the world people can't buy us paper, I don't quite understand. But you know what it really resulted in, in the lunacy of it all? I would take a chunk of paper down to the department photocopy machine, run off a few copies, quickly grab the stuff, go back to my office and think, oh man, I forgot my extra paper. Then I would run back, whew, open up the machine and it's gone. Now the sane person would say, let go of the 20 cents worth of paper and go back to your office. But no, somebody had my paper. <laughs> and so then you go by, did you take my paper? Do you know where my paper is? I need my paper. We're talking about pennies here and it's wasted energy, but that's how bad the conditions can be. I've bought my own chalk before. When I first started teaching, you could tell that I was a teacher who used chalk a lot, by the way, because this hand, my right hand, my dominant hand, my fingers were all cracked and bleeding all semester because I would use the chalk so much that it would dry out my fingers because we couldn't afford the chalk that would actually not dry out my fingers. But I did that. I'm a teacher. It's what I do. 